Batman cannot solve every problem within Gotham City. What if it was time for the next Batman? This is the Comic Story and Channel, where I take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and I break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. Then I read them dramatically back to you, allowing you to get a synopsis of the storylines happening within the world of comics today so that you can go to your local comic book store or digital outlet and buy the next issues or get more context by buying these issues. We take our synopsis and we bring you a dramatic reading where I pretended to act out a lot of the characters and dramatically say it in my voice. Today we're going to be covering Batman Second Son issues 1 through 12. So just a little context, Lucius Fox has built things for Batman, and Luke Fox has been Batwing. But Lucius Fox's family is a rich black family within Gotham City, dealing with its own problems and issues, including a son that did something so wrong that he was basically pushed out of the family and has now chosen to return. So what is going to happen to the family that is basically adjacent to Batman with all of Batman's technology at their fingertips. This is the story, The Next Batman. And if you enjoy this, consider pressing that bell and getting a notification as to when we bring out more content right here at the Comic Story and Channel. We're bringing you comic book videos two to five times a week right here. Deep in one of the provinces in Vietnam, a pair of binoculars peers through the bushes looking at Tyler Arkadine. Arkadine is somebody who thinks that he's somebody because he has a lot of money. Millions, really. But unless you're creeping up on billions, you're a nobody. At least, that's what the billionaires want people to think. That people with money are somebodies and everybody else is a nobody. And that's why Tim Fox is here. Lucius Fox's second son, going by the name Jace now. As Jace stands up from the brush, he asks his operator, Vol, if they see anything. Vol says that they're here. He's sure that he wants to do this. And Jace asks, what? Take out an entitled scumbag like Arcadine? Vol clears their throat, stating that what they meant was that Vietnam is a wonderful country, but the government doesn't much care for extra legal operators. Jace pulls down his mask, telling them that they just have to make sure that they don't get caught. How about giving them some cover? At that moment, the generator powering Arcadine's home begins to overcharge and explode. While the guards quickly gather, Jace sneaks into the house and into Arcadine's office. He plugs into the jump drive to upload a virus, and as the virus begins to do its work, Vol says that this computer has some pretty high-grade military cybersecurity, going to take a bit to get through. But once Vol gets in, they state that there isn't anything here. The hard drive's already been wiped. Jace asks, how is that possible? Why would they have all of the security and... Oh. At that moment, armed guards step into the room, opening fire, forcing Jace to jump out the window. As he lands, Arcadine walks up. What you didn't know is that I was hip to all of this. You think I'm that stupid? Jace tells him. No, we think that you're a piece of crap who fronts as a philanthropist while running a trafficking ring. Arcadine laughs, asking, Is that what you think? Too bad you're gonna die and not even know what for. Jace then takes out a collapsible baton, extending it, throwing it right at Arcadine's head. As the metal cracks him in the head, Arcadine falls to the ground, grabbing the baton, handing it to one of his guards, stating, Take this and beat the hell out of him! The guards soon begin to surround Jace, but Jace fights back, taking the baton, throwing it at the guard. Then two more armed guards open fire from the walls, with Jace jumping onto one of the nearby four-wheelers, escaping the compound. As Jace speeds off, he pulls off his mask, telling Vol that he messed up. Bad. Same as always. Vol tells him that his lapses in self-pity are as tiring as they were when they were first back at the farm. They'll get another chance soon enough, though. Once Jace makes sure that no one is following him, he quietly heads into the old, run-down apartment building that is his hideout. And when he opens the door, a voice tells him, I'm tired, I'm hungover, and I would rather be in a gajillion other places. Jace looks at Grifter. Grifter goes on stating, You really shouldn't cause any trouble. Daddy wants you to come home. So, it's the next day that Jace walks through the Gotham airport when his mother Tanya and sisters Tamara and Tiffany come running up to hug him. Tamara and Tiffany welcome him home, and Tanya says that his father wanted to be here, but Jace tells him that he knows. Richest man on the planet, and he can't buy time for his son. Tanya begins to state, Tim, but Jace stops her. It's Jace now, and it's cool. As they all leave, Jace asks, what about Luke? Where is he? Tanya says that Luke said something about something. Meanwhile, over at the local grocery store, the armed gunman yells to the employees as he fires his gun, telling them that they don't belong. They need to go back to their country. But as the voice calls out to the man, he immediately spins back and shoots. 
Batwing drops his camo, punching the man to disarm him, but the gunman then takes out another gun and shoots several times. The bullets at the force field, and Batwing says that he's got an EMF generator protecting him, and they've got nothing. Batwing then reaches forward, grabbing the man's hand, crushing it just in time for the GCPD to surround the two of them. One of the officers says that that's enough, and Batwing tells them that there was an active shooter. There are plenty of witnesses if you... Another officer says that they don't need his help, they'll take it from here. Batwing laughs as he reactivates his camo, telling him, Sure, you're welcome. The officer scoffs. <laughs> Freaking masks. Later in Lucius' office, Lucius asks what did they find out about his son, and Grifter asks what does he want to know. His kid was hanging out in some backwater burg in Vietnam. Not sure what he was doing, but whatever it was, it was on the Ultra DL. And he didn't get home until real late anyway. But what I can say is that they refused to fly back on the family's personal jet. Said that they'd fly commercial and coach. Who the hell flies coach from Vietnam, Lucius? Lucius asks if his son Tim, but Grifter stops him. Your son calls himself Jace now, for whatever the reason. So Lucius pauses. Is Jace able to handle this deposition? Is he emotionally stable for it? Grifter asks, Does he have his crap together? Hard to say. Bringing him back was my job. Fixing the kid isn't. Meanwhile, over in Mayor Nakano's, Nakano leans on his desk telling Rene Montoya that the past is over and done. Yesterday is yesterday, and from here on, it's all about the new. Insanity like the Joker War? Never again. They're shutting down masks for good. Rene says that that's been tried before, and Nakano then says that those were half-hearted attempts to register them, to deputize them. He's talking about making their activities illegal in the extreme, and when it comes to the law, he's going to need a police commissioner willing to enforce it. Renee asks why her, and Nakano goes on stating that she put in several years, from beat cop to major crimes. She's got the respect of everybody walking the line. Renee says that she was a drunk, and she got her partner killed. And Nakano goes on stating, that is a little dramatic. And unlike Gordon, who was a flunky for the Batman, he wouldn't be able to enforce this, but you would. Renee tells him that he's asking for a lot, and Nakano says that he is asking her to stop the carnage. No more masks, not the bad ones, not the ones that we think are good. We can rebuild the city, rebuild it to be better. Renee says that she needs to think on it. And later in the Fox home, Tanya asks Jace, how does it feel to be home? Jace jokes, stating that the place is nice. Surprised that they didn't buy Wayne Manor, though. Tanya says that she needs him to please try and work things out with his father. This has been very hard on him. During the war with the Joker, he was assaulted, brutalized, and all the money in the world can't make trauma go away. Just then, a door opens up, and Tanya tells Luke that his brother is here. Come say hello. Jace holds up his arm, stating that it's been a while, and Luke looks at him, turning without saying a word. Tanya tries to comfort him, but Jay says it's alright. It was a long flight, and he's going to go get some air. As he walks outside, Tamara is sitting on the bench and asks what has he been up to, and Jace sits down, stating, Right now, I'm hanging out with you, but in general, I have no clue. I shouldn't have come back. Mom is disappointed in me, Dad hasn't forgiven me, and Luke straight up hates me. Mara leans over, hugging him, stating that she missed him. She missed her brother. All those years, not a phone call, not an email, he just disappeared. And Jay sighs, stating that he did enough damage. He used to blame Dad for what he did, he still does. But what he did, he did for his family. Staying away was the least that they could do. Tamara tells him no. Staying away was about him, for him. It was so that he could live without guilt. Would he have even come home if Dad hadn't dragged him back for the deposition? Jay says that being here when they were millionaires wasn't very good. Not sure if it'll be any different now that they're not billionaires. But there's nothing for him here. Tamara tells him, asking, Nothing? You were a lot of things back in the day. Arrogant, hard-headed, spoiled, but above all, you were my brother. No matter what, I thought that that would never change. As Tamara gets up and leaves, she tells him that it would seem that nothing lasts forever. Does it, Chase? The next day, Lucius watches the news about a break-in at Arkham Asylum when his aide comes in stating that his son is here. Lucius looks back stating, Tim. But Jace corrects him, telling him that he is not Tim. It's... And Lucius stops him. I know, I'm sorry. It's one of those things that takes getting used to. As Jace tells him that it's not a thing, Lucius says that he didn't ask him to come here so that they can argue. There are some things that they need to discuss away from the rest of the family. He has this deposition scheduled. He'll need to get together with the lawyers and... Jace tells him, nah... Not this time. No lawyers, no private investigations, no leaks to the media. Lucius stops him. Will you listen? You don't understand how important this is. We are trying to protect this family. You weren't here when we were given control of the Wayne fortune. You didn't read all the vile nonsense said online. Jay stops him. Is that what you're worried about? What people say on social media? Lucius says that this city is recovering from a war. And maybe another one is starting. 
Fox tech is needed, and it cannot be taken away because of a mistake that you made when you were 17. Jace asks, Mistake? Say it! Say what I did! The two stare at each other for a moment, and Jace goes on telling him, I won't be meeting with any lawyers. At this deposition, I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and what I'm going to say will be the truth. Thanks for the meeting. See you at home, Dad. Meanwhile, out on the street, Mayor Nakano heads to a crime and telling Renee that it didn't take long for the Joker to get back to the slaughtering, and it won't take long for a Batman to respond, and for more people to get killed in the crosshairs. Hopefully, she's considering the offer. Renee tells him if they are going to have these laws passed, people under her command are not going to be assassins. Nakano says that he wouldn't ask them to be. He wouldn't need them to be. Her people need to focus on the job to protect and serve. He has other plans for the masks. Renee says as long as he understands, she'll enforce the law, but she will not bend it. She will not break it. Nakano holds out his hand, stating that he understands. Do they have a deal? And Renee reaches out to shake his hand. Back at the Fox home, Luke returns home to find his sister Tiffany on the bed. He asks what she's doing and she says waiting for him to tell her why he refuses to acknowledge their brother. Luke says that he's been busy, now off to bed. Tiffany sits up asking what's more important than family and Luke tells her, looking for the Joker. Tiffany then says there are like 50 bat people who can do that. It sounds like you'd rather hunt down a psychopath than deal with your family. And Luke tells her that he would rather hunt down a psychopath. That says more about this family than it does him. Tiffany reaches out asking, how about they work on that then? How about they spend some time with their brother? Be cool about it. A few moments later, Tiffany grabs Luke, telling everyone, look who she found. Jace turns to say hi, and Luke says, hello, Jace. It's Jace, right? Don't want to offend you by accidentally using your real name. Tamara gets up stating, that was not necessary. And Luke responds, clearly it was. He gets upset anytime someone calls him Tim. Isn't that right? Timmy, because you think you can change your name, change your past? It doesn't change anything. It sure as hell doesn't change what you put this family through. Jay says that he doesn't get to preach. He never did anything except sit there and live off dad's money. While they argue, Tamara gets up telling them both to stop, please. And then Tanya tells them that that's enough. And as they continue, Tamara collapses. Everyone runs over, but Luke pushes Jace away, telling him to get away. Tanya picks Tamara up, stating that it's going to be okay, just hang on. They're there for her. So later at the hospital, the doctor tells everyone that Tamara has returned to a persistent vegetative state. By all indications, her condition is the result of toxic poisoning. Lucius asks, didn't she get through it though? The poisoning from the rat catcher. And the doctor says that their daughter was in remission. She was immune suppressed and remained at risk for a relapse. Luke says that this thing, it happened at Arkham. The toxins from that, they just caused a relapse? And the doctor says that they can't say for certain, but environmental causes could have contributed. Luke asks, what environmental causes? Something that changed in her? Like something that's different? Something that wasn't around that maybe caused stress that she couldn't handle? When Luke directs that comment at Jace, Tanya says that it was the masks. One way or another, the masks did this to her. Lucius asks, can Tamara get better? And the doctor says that without knowing the exact toxin that has been poisoning her, they won't be able to do anything. Tiffany then asks, what if they did have that toxin? And the doctor says that it would certainly help them build a genetic roadmap for a possible cure. Lucius then tells the doctor that he'd want them to make sure that they do anything that they can for their daughter. Whatever it takes, whatever it costs. Jace asks, whatever it costs? You've got all the money in the world, but we already know. You can't buy life. So later that night, Jace takes some time to breathe when he gets a call from Vol. He tells them that he was kind of going through some stuff, but Vol says that that's unfortunate, but now is the time. They've got Intel and Arcadine. Arcadine has a personal courier on his way to Gotham. He's arriving shortly in a private jet. So a short while later, Jace gets into position, stating that he sees the plane landing and has eyes on the courier. He asks what do they know about him, and Vol says very little. The man is a cipher. Since they tried to hack Arcadine, he's been extra paranoid. Whatever the courier has, it's something that Arcadine only trusts with him. Jason looks at the others around the man, stating that he's got some serious heavy hitters protecting him, and somebody else. She's. But Jace trails off. Vol asks what, and Jace says, I could swear to God that this woman turned and looked directly at me. Vol begins to ask, how would they know that he's there? And Jace tells them, hang on, I got company. Just then, two armed men turn the corner, yelling to come out with their hands up. Jace ducks underneath some scaffolding, and one of the men says, see, told you, nobody's here. 
Once the coast is clear, Jace sneaks away stating that they need to find out what the courier is transporting. But Vol says that Arcadine has upped his game. He's now using programs even they can't hack. And if they want intel, they're going to need some better tech. So Jace says that he has an idea. He'll be in touch. And back home, Tiffany sits out on the patio with Luke coming up asking how is she doing. He knows how bad she's hurting right now. Tiffany tells him that she isn't hurting. She's angry, angry at this family. Everyone is pointing fingers at someone else for what happened to Tamara. Dad blames what happened to at Arkham. Mom blames the masks and he blames Jace. But the truth is he knows what happened to Tamara. He knows what they did to their sister, his friend Russell. Jace says that Russell isn't a friend. And Tiffany goes on telling him, well then your little pet, the rat catcher. I was there. I was forced to watch while they poisoned Tamara, while they brutalized and dumped her body. And if we can't correct what they did, then at the very least, someone needs to pay for it. Luke says that she was too young to be cynical, and Tiffany gets up stating that she is too old to be naive. Actions have consequences, and so do inactions. Inactions may cost Tamara her life. It's time to do something, Luke. Luke says that he doesn't know what she and Tiffany looks at him. Not you. Him. Do something. Luke gets up, putting on the suit, telling her, yeah. Elsewhere, Jay says that he knows that he's made some bad choices, bad decisions. He left home to try and get himself fixed, but the truth is, he's running away from all the stuff that he got wrong. So it's time for him to quit running. It's time for him to stop talking. It's time to start contributing. What he wants is to be a part of something bigger than himself. Lucius smiles that he's happy to hear that. They are very happy to have him start working at Fox Tech. A few days later, Tiffany sits in Jace's office, stating that she doesn't understand why he's doing this. He didn't care about the family business before. Jace says that people change. He never appreciated what dad did for them. Now he is. Tiffany begins to say what she thinks, but then stops when suddenly an image on her phone appears. Jace asks, what is it? And Tiffany holds up her phone, showing a picture of Tamara in the hospital with Jace asking, what the hell is that? How did someone get a picture like that? Tiffany says that it's not somebody, it's you bets. You Betts is a social media jerk who goes around getting pictures of celebrities when they're jacked. Jay says that Tamara is not a celebrity, and Tiffany responds with no, but she is the daughter of one of the richest guys on the planet. You Betts doesn't care a thing about her, he's just trying to get more followers. What I'd give to punch him right in the... But Jay stops her stating, What will that do? It'll make him more famous. The universe will give him what he's got coming soon. Tiffany says that he really has changed, and Jay says that he had a good teacher while he was gone. They helped him learn a few things about patience. Now, why doesn't she head home? He'll stop by the hospital and talk to them about beefing up security. Before Tiffany leaves, she turns back stating that it's good to have him back. And once gone, Jace calls Vol. Vol says that those codes that he's got access to, they're brilliant. Jace tells them later with that. He needs to find everything they can about a guy on social. Goes by the hand, you bets. Later that night, Jace takes position on a building outside of a club with Vol asking, You know that you bets has over 1.3 million followers, right? And Jay says, I really don't care. Vol says that it seems very much beneath him, chasing after someone who's internet famous. Jace tells him that he told his sister that the universe has a way of working itself out. The universe isn't going to disappoint her. Vol goes on stating that they have a trace on you bets phone, but Jay says that there's no need. Just then, the bouncers of the club throw you bets out back and grab him, stating that if they catch him trying to sneak pictures again, they'll take his phone in. And at that moment, Jace calls out that he'd be down for that, but you bets has had enough. One of the bouncers grabs Jace, telling him, If you open up your mouth again, but Jace grabs the bouncer's arm, twisting it and putting him down. Another bouncer swings, but Jace moves out of the way, responding with a hit of his own, knocking him out. You bets laughs, stating, That was nice! Damn, I owe you! But as Ubets holds out his fist, Jace grabs it, crushing it, telling him, Tomorrow, you're off social. You'll never post again. I will own you like a pony. Feel me? You're canceled, man. Meanwhile, in the underneath, the rat catcher pets one of his rats, stating that their street magic is a waste down here. You can see that he has ears on him. So, get to it and quit wasting his time. Luke turns off his camo, and the rat catcher says, There you are. A bat. So rare to have one visit this part of the city. Luke tells her that he poisoned someone. Tamara Fox and he needs the cure. And if he doesn't, Ratcatcher says, Should have guessed. The only time the masks show up is to serve their money masters. Nobody cares about the people of Gotham that are abandoned in the underneath. But some say that you and your army will come calling for what they're owed. As the rats gather, Luke says that he has no interest in his vermin collection. And the Ratcatcher asks, Vermin? Ha! There's a word! 
Nah, I'm done with vermin. My new rats are many. They are hungry, and they are tired of being neglected. And my rats, they're so very well-armed. As Luke hears shuffling, he turns to see the rats that he was talking about. Their children holding bats. Luke asks, Instead of poisoning them, you're brainwashing kids? And the rat catcher tells him, I'm not doing anything of the sort. They're just as I found them. Abandoned, abused, unloved. Gotham's one of the richest cities in the world, and this is the best it could do with its neglected children? There's no need for brainwashing here. Just give them food, shelter, and put a gun in their hands, and tell them to be somebody. And what's the best way to be somebody? Kill a bat! At that moment, a small robot rolls between the children and begins to fire. Luke quickly puts up his barrier to stop the bullets, but the rat catcher tells him that it's a nice toy. The thing about toys is they're only fun until they get broken. Up above the rafters, a young girl points a large rifle at Luke's back, firing. The bullet breaks through and into Luke's shoulder, with the rat catcher waving, That's my girl! Luke falls to his knees, the barrier dropping, and the children quickly run in and begin to hit him. The rat catcher calls out, asking, are you pulling your punches? Why? Because they're children? People like you, you never cared about them before. You let them go hungry, get abused, and when you're faced with your failures, that's when you felt guilt. Too late. Too damn late! At that moment, the doors are kicked open as the GCPD storm into the warehouse. The little girl up top fires, nearly hitting the officers, and Detective Chubb gives the order to return fire. One of the bullets hits the rat catcher in the head, with Luke telling them to stop their children. And with no signs of the officers letting up, Luke punches a support pillar, bringing down the entire structure. As everyone clears out, the dust begins to settle. And as the rat catcher's mask lays on the floor, the little girl looks at it, picking it up. Later at the hospital, Tiffany sits by Tamara's bed when she hears somebody calling out to her. Tiffany sees that it's Luke and asks if he found the rat catcher, if he has the cure. And Luke says that he did find him, but the police got their end. Tiffany yells, you didn't get the cure, did you? You messed up. I trusted you and you messed up. Tiffany gets up to leave and Luke tells her to wait, but Tiffany doesn't go very far. Luke looks up to see Tiffany hugging Jace. It was another busy night in Gotham City when a short woman walks by a group of guys, all cat calling her while she looks down at her phone. She walks past telling them to sod off and the guys stop her asking, what did she say? She can either show them some respect or they can. Before the thug could even turn around, the woman grabs him by the arm and throws an elbow into his stomach. As he falls, the thug's friends jump in to help, but the woman proceeds to knock the other two to the ground, all while still holding her phone. Once she's finished, she fixes her jacket and continues on her way. And across the street, a group of onlookers gather, asking each other if anyone recorded that. And among them, Jace sits in the back. Vol asks if he got what he wanted, although paying those guys to assault her. Jace tells them that anyone stupid enough to take money to rough somebody up deserves what they get. But this Eve person is... Vol stops him. No, not Eve. Ebha. Ebba O'Rourke. Going up against Ebba is going to be a difficult task. Her father was in the IRA and an expert in making people disappear during troubling times. Jace heads back to his bike, responding with... If we want to get Arcadine's courier, we're going to have to go through Ebba and her crew. Vol begins to tell him that there's something else, but Jace tells him that he can handle it. Vol says that that wasn't what he was going to ask. He talked to Hydea. She says, hey, anything he'd like her to know? Jace thinks and ponders and then stops himself. Don't tell her anything. Just keep an eye on the courier and Ebba. Later that night, Luke sits out in the garden with his father, Lucius, coming out telling him that he wasn't sure that the family would make use of such a place. It seems to be quite the gathering spot. Luke says that they shouldn't have brought him home. Lucius stops. Jace is a part of this family. Luke yells that since Jace got back, everything's gone south. With Tam, with Tiff. But Lucius stops him, telling him that the masks are to blame for what happened to Tamara. And whatever alienation that they're feeling with Tiffany, that's between them. Luke shouts that they're always giving Jace second chances. All he ever did was turn his back on our family and run the streets and act out. When does it end, Dad? How many chances is he going to have? Lucia says as many as it takes. Their family has been given the responsibility to protect this city. That's what Bruce Wayne wanted. At all costs and by whatever means. That is my obligation and I cannot carry it out while the rest of you wallow in your weakness. Luke stares for a moment at the harsh words. 
and then says, ever since Punchline did what she did, he's been dealing with a lot. Maybe it would help talking to somebody. Lucius asks, you think that there's something wrong with you? You're the one sitting out here alone, trying to fix our problems by staring at the ground. So if anyone needs something to work on, it's you. The next morning, Jay sits with his mother, Tanya, shortly before his deposition, as she tells him that this is what he's going to read for his statement. Jace takes the paper and says that he's going under oath. If this statement is full of lies, they'll find out. Tanya says that no one will find out anything. She was able to get a court order to exclude certain evidence from, but Jay stops her. When does it all stop? Dad used his money to get what he wants, and you use the law. Nobody cares about doing the right thing. Tanya snaps that what is right is protecting him, his brother, and his sisters. And if he won't think of himself, then think of them. At that moment, the door opens and a lawyer comes out telling them that they're ready. Jason and Tanya head into the next room and the mediator says to please have a seat. They're about to give a deposition in the civil matter of a Savito v. Fox. Tim, you understand that the testimony you are giving is under oath and you are subject to penalties of perjury. Jay says that he does, and as he looks at the paper that Tanya gave him, she glares at his hesitation. Yes, I'm ready to make my statement. First thing you have to understand, what happened, none of it was my mom or my dad's fault. My mom was always there for us, always our fiercest protector, our best teacher. She always told us that there are two things that you can never walk away from, when you make a life or when you take a life. One is bound by love, the other is responsibility. Our dad, Lucius, well... Dad was the COO of Wayne Enterprises. That made him one of the most prominent businessmen in Gotham. In America, hell, the world. He was prominently everywhere, except at home. Working for Wayne meant that he was up early and in the office late. With the dad away all the time, he didn't consider it all one way or the other. My dad was kind of around when we needed him, always getting us nice and expensive things. My younger brother Luke was always hitting the books, and Tiffany, well, she was just a kid back then. So Tam was like my best friend, and whatever we did, we did together. Life was good. All I had to worry about was when the next party was, or who the next girl that I was going to talk to was. Consequences, accountability, purpose, none of that meant anything to me. Pleasure was random and disposable, and once it was had, I was on to the next. When I was turning 17, I was going to the biggest, baddest party, and then she walked by. I tried talking to a girl who was at that party, but after trying to put the moves on her, she blew me off. In fact, she was the first girl to ever straight up reject me. A stuck up girl was walking away from me. So I decided I was still gonna have some fun that night and called up an old fling. And that's when it happened. I hit someone. And when it was said and done, I had to make a decision and I did. I couldn't think about what to do except to go to the man who was never around and who always knew how to make things right. Before Jace could continue, Tanya tells him that that is enough. And the mediator says that her son hasn't finished his statement. Tanya tells him that she isn't here as Jace's, or Tim's, mother. She's here as his lawyer. He's being deposed regarding the night in question, and he answered truthfully. Any other aspects of the incident, no criminal charges were ever filed. And they know why. Because they know who was at fault that night. And all of this is just a morbid attempt at a cash grab. Pursue it further at your own risk. The Acevedo family's lawyer says people like you... You always think everything is about money, but where's your soul? How much are you going to sell that for? Tanya grabs her briefcase, telling Jace that they're done here. Let's go. Outside, Jace says that he wasn't finished with his statement, and Tanya tells him that he was. He told him the truth about that night. About that night. Nothing else. Anything else that you would have said serves nothing except your own self-pity. We are being extorted, and those people? But Jace stops her. Really? Those people? Tanya glares. You better not be throwing your sensibilities at me. I am trying to protect you, same as your father tried. And if Lucius had done a better job back then, we wouldn't be here now. Yes, I feel bad for that family, for what happened to them, but I refuse to feel guilty for doing what's right for us as a family. I would suggest that you do the same. Later that night, Jace gets out of the shower thinking that he hurts. Physically, emotionally, and he thought that telling the truth somehow would make everything right. Not change what happened, but balance things out. The man that he ran over is still dead and their family is still hurting. Killing that man was an accident, but everything that happened after that, that was the real crime. 
After Jace explained what happened that night, Lucius back then said that he would take care of things, which involved Lucius and his team finding every bad thing about Enrico Civito, leaking it to every media outlet possible. They spun the story as if Jace was the victim. Back then, Jace still didn't feel right about the situation, so Lucius sent him off to Sanford Military Academy, an international boarding school. This is the place where rich parents dumped their kids with problems, or addiction issues, or if they were just too busy to be parents. Jace wasn't sure what he was supposed to learn back then, but he learned more than his dad figured he would. One day after being struck down by his combat training instructor, Jace decided to just not even fight back. His friend Vol and Hadia would rag on him, but it was Hadia who told him that he needs to grow from his mistakes and not punish himself over and over. She asked him if he really needed to be punished, or if there was a better use of the emotions that he was feeling. The truth was he didn't really know who needed to be punished, or what to do with his emotions. He knew that Hadia was right, and what he did was start looking for answers. So we went back to his instructor when he was finally ready to learn. However, now back in our current day, Jace receives a call from Vol telling him that they got an intercept on Arcadine's courier. There's going to be a meeting set for tonight and they're handing off whatever it is that he is transporting. Just please don't rush into this thinking that there is something to prove. Jace says that he's doing this because he knows what happens when people think that they're above the law. And if he dies trying, then he supposes that's justice too. As night falls, Ebba and her crew get ready to go to their meeting when they suddenly see a person on a motorcycle speeding towards them. The driver asks what they should do and Ebba tells them not to slow down and as he gets closer, Jace extends his baton, throwing it through the windshield, hitting the driver in the face, causing him to swerve into the light post. The driver stumbles out of the car, grabbing his gun, but Jace kicks the door shut, disarming him, sending him to the ground. One of the passengers gets out with his gun, so Jace jumps over the hood, grabbing the man's arm, knocking him out before he can get another shot off. As he turns back, Jace sees Ebba with the last man of her crew and the courier telling everyone that that is enough. She isn't armed, so let's just talk. What is this about? She knows that he's been watching her, testing her. Why? What's got you so bothered? Jace points to the courier, telling her that she is protecting that one, and he works for Arcadine. I want what's in the bag. Ebba laughs, telling him that if he knew what was in the bag, he couldn't stop what was going to happen. Jace flicks his wrist, extending another baton. Fine. Guess I'll just have to put you down for nothing. As he swings, Ebba blocks Jace's arm with her own, waiting for him to overextend, and then takes out her knife. Once there's an opening, she takes that knife, slamming it into Jace's side, sending him to the ground. She stands over him, telling him, You have been watching us, and I have been watching you. So much talent wasted. Last gunman tried to say something, but Ebba continues talking to Jace, telling him that he is a poor, miserable man. Mr. Arcadine told him right. He is going to die, and he won't even know what for. Finally, the gunman yells to everyone, and when Ebba asks what is it, he says that there is a sword sticking out of his shoulder. At that moment, a foot kicks the gunman forward as the sword is pulled out, and Katana tells Jace, It's good to see you. It's been a while. As the sword is pulled out of the guard, Ebba holds out her knife, stating, That is a big old sword, and all I've got is this little thing. That's not fair. And Katana tells her, I'm not trying to be fair. As Ebba takes off her jacket, she pulls out a second, larger knife from her back holster, telling her, well, to be honest, I wasn't either. Ebba lunges forward and Katana takes out her dagger, deflecting the hit. And as she wildly swings, Katana leaps up, kicking Ebba to the ground. She jumps to her feet, slashing, but while the two of them go back and forth, the courier begins to run, stating, forget this! But before he can get far, Jace punches him, taking the bag, telling him, you're not going anywhere. Finally, Katana begins to really fight back, and after knocking Ebba to the ground, she goes to finish the fight when suddenly she's told, hold that. The police begin to surround the area as Ebba yells for them to piss off and throws her knife, hitting one of the officers in the shoulder. The police begin to shoot, but Katana throws her dagger handle first, knocking out an officer. She kicks a second, and as the officer stands alone, Katana says that they are not their enemy. She helps Jace up, and Officer Chubb shouts that they're not friends either. And pretty soon, it's going to be shoot on sight. And I will be looking forward to that day. After escaping, Jace pulls up his mask, telling Katana that he is digging the grave. Katana tells him thanks. Time to show her age, even if she doesn't act it. And speaking of age, that nonsense he pulled, he was lucky that she was there. Vol said that he could use a little backup. Katana then says that woman... Jace tells her that she knows her legend. Katana interrupts telling him it's not a legend, she's a killer. That's a fact. 
Attacking her directly? Come on. I trained you better than that, Jace. What? You trained me to fight up close. And I thought that if I got a hold of what's in the bag, we could shut down the guy who's paying her. Katana tells him sure, but he can't stop anyone if he's dead. And not caring if he lives or dies? That doesn't get the job done. He has to put aside the death wish that he has. Jace tells her that she doesn't understand. She has killed people who deserve it, not an innocent man crossing the street. She tells him that a life is a life. She has no right to so easily decide who lives and who dies. The person she is now regrets the person that she was. She is thankful for the person that she has become. And when he told her his new name and why he chose it, she thought that he had learned to forgive himself. There are people who care about him, for him, for her, to get rid of this guilt, to be a symbol of better things. As she gets up, Jace asks if he's going to see her again. And Katana tells him that he knows her. She's always around when needed. Later in the hospital, Luke says that he is sorry. But what happened to Tim? Tanya tells him that he got stabbed breaking up an assault. He wasn't hurt badly, and he was able to get himself to a doctor. Luke asks if she believed him because he probably got into a beef at a nightclub over someone's girl. Jace is irresponsible. Dad should never have let him come back. Tiffany then says, you know what? For somebody who's got all the answers, you sure aren't very good at fixing problems. Tane then asks, what is that supposed to mean? And Tiffany walks off telling her that it means that Luke fronts. But when it comes time to work, their sister is still lying in a coma because he couldn't figure out how to help her. Tanya looks at Luke, asking what is she talking about, and Luke tries to speak, but then sighs, telling her that Tiffany is telling the truth. If he had been a better brother, if he had been a better man, maybe Tam wouldn't still be in the hospital. As Luke turns to leave, Tanya calls out to him, but Tiffany says to leave him. He's useless. They've got to start figuring out how to get things done on their own. Meanwhile, back at Wayne Enterprises, Jace groans, holding his side in his office. And Vol tells him that the bag contained six identification cards, combinations of driver's license, state IDs. And Jace asks, what about ours? What about them? Are they forged? Vol tells him, nope, they're real. And they belong to people on the government watch list, all associated with left-leaning radicals, anarchists, anti-globalists, anti-fat. But Jace pauses. Why does Arkadine's courier have the IDs of six radicals? And Vol says that he isn't sure, but they are off the grid. He's doing a complete trace on them, and he's coming up with nothing. However, he did find something... something weird. Jace asks if it's about Arkadine, and Vol tells him no. The source codes that he lifted from his dad to help hack Arkadine. It shows a few files deeply buried and heavily encrypted. One of them, Jace looks at his computer, stating, I see it. The clade of Kiro Petra. That's a word party. How's your Latin? Vol tells him not good, but he'll look into it. But there's something else in the code about hibernaculum. It's in sub-basement three of the building. Jace pauses. There is no sub-basement three of Wayne Enterprises. Vol continues. There's a private elevator and it's locked up and powered down. Jace thinks about it for a moment. Can you unlock it? Because I'm gonna go see what's down in sub-basement three myself. Meanwhile, back in Lucius's office, Simon Saint sits down asking if he's considered his initiative, and Lucius tells him that he is curious. Curious to better understand his intentions using their technology. Saint tells him that his intention is to apply their tech in the most effective way possible. Use it to end the cycle of violence in which people of Gotham are caught up in. He understands that during the Joker War, but Lucius stops him. I would rather not discuss that. Saint says, of course, I understand, but I imagine that we both agree that the masks in this city are out of control. A day was just the beginning. God knows where it'll end. What I do know is next time it can't be like last time. If we learn from our past, if we focus on the future at which we are arriving, that future, it may be a beast that tramples us, such as the Joker War, or we can face it head on. Whether or not we win that fight, well, that may be entirely up to you. But back with Jace, he now walks into a large room, stating to Vol that he's in. And they turn the power on. The lights come on, and Jace looks around, telling him that the place looks like a factory, but it's wrecked. Like someone fought a war in here. There's one terminal working barely. Most of the drives are wiped. But there are still a couple of files. Might be able to... Vol says that he looked up what the clade of Kiropetra is. It's not Latin. It's Greek. The clade of Kiropetra 
means the family of the bat. As the heavy doors begin to open, Jace says that this place is like a testing facility, an armory. And Vol asks, what would his father have in an armory then? Jace looks up at the bat suit behind the doors, stating, it's not my father's armory. My father, Bruce Wayne. God knows how many people. They're the clay to Kira Petra. They work for Batman. And there you have it, the first 12 issues of Batman's Second Son. Now you're probably wondering, Benny, that was a cliffhanger. You brought us the original 10 episodes that you already did on the channel, and then you brought the finale, the issue 11 and 12. What happened? Because he just discovered the bat suit. We're finally going to get Batman's Second Son. Well, uh, DC decided to end the story there and bring you another story within the world of Next Batman. The follow-up to this storyline is I Am Batman, and it just started. I believe we're on issue two or three at this point. So we'll be getting to it here on the channel, and when we're done with all of it, we're going to bring you a full story of the entire Jace saga and how Jace became the next Batman. If you want to know when that finally comes out here on the channel, make sure you press that bell to get notifications. We're bringing you DC Comics and Marvel Comics on a regular basis, and we give you information to let you become a comic book master right here at the Comic Story and Channel. A like on this video goes a very very long way and a comment as to what you think about Batman Second Son down below really does help us out. And if you want to help us out even further, please consider going to our Patreon, patreon.com slash comic historian, where you can get even more videos as we produce more videos than you see here and they go up to the Patreon. Thank you guys and we'll see you next time right here at Comic Story.